Hey folks, welcome back to the Dark Horse Podcast live stream number 107 Q&A. Sorry for the long pause. That was a technical difficulty entirely outside of our control. But here we're here we are. We are ready. To here we are taking back control. A modicum of control. I don't know how much that is, but I, th- I think it's like a smidge. It's a smidge. Yeah. It's it's, uh, it's it's more than an Omicron. Wow. All right. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. I, I can live with that. Okay. Um, chipping away at the narrative requires discomfort. One way is to stop doing things that serve no purpose except to feed the narrative and people's neuroses, like wearing a mask outside. Be kind but firm. Takes courage but creates courage in others. Months ago in Phoenix, a few stopped masking, and now masks are rare. I think this is true for some things and won't work for some others, right? And I, I mean, I do think the question of outdoor masking uh, has, for us, always been so obvious and straightforward that um, I think I may have mentioned, um, I don't know when it would have been, at some point, uh, probably pre-vaccine stuff, so maybe like... 14 months ago or so, I was walking in some park that I love uh, with wide paths. Um, You could easily stay away from people. And uh, some woman with a mask yelled in my direction um, at uh, someone behind me who was also masked, thank you for wearing a mask. I'm like, well, that was not only not direct to me, but clearly passive aggressive and obnoxious. And, uh, you know, I thought about trying to engage her and it's like, no, I'm just, I, I refuse to wear a mask outside. We do still wear masks inside as we are um, supposedly required to in the state of Oregon. I would say we wear them inside when required. When well, yes, requested. We, yeah, we wear masks inside when, when required too. We are beginning to hear <clears throat> tales of outside <clears throat> in other areas in Oregon, especially just even even really just outside of Portland, um, some places not um, not requiring them. Um, but the signs on every store here is according you know according to the governor's orders, everyone must be masked to come inside the store. Yeah, but I think there is a question here because mm-hmm. um, as we've mentioned before, the evidence that cloth masks work is extremely thin, and the evidence like that the other themselves. other masks work is dependent on them being worn uh, in a particular way. And the chances that this is actually a place where, um, you know, it makes sense to have this kind of, uh, authoritarianism is pretty low. So the question is, I know that personally I wear them when required to, because I am not interested in sending a signal to my fellow citizens that I am defecting on them that mm-hmm. I am in any way callous about their well-being. I would absolutely give the middle finger to the authorities that require these things when it obviously isn't about health or they're so inept that they don't know, you know, that they should be telling you, uh, go outside and delight in the fact that you don't need a mask there. So the point is... But the, but there, but I, I can hear the argument from some people that will say... Um, these are the same people who think that you are defecting on them by not becoming vaccinated. Right. Therefore, you know, how, how is this any different? Well, because the point is we are being dragged into a signal, mm-hmm. the signal of the mask. It is the signal of a cult. Mm-hmm. I don't wish to broadcast that signal at all. Now, my vaccination status is nobody's business, really. Now, again, there are circumstances in which a particular disease with particular public health authorities and a particular vaccine could justify a mandate. So I'm not opting out on that. But I guess my point is, because the vaccine status is not obvious anywhere, this is a much more ambiguous thing. But Well, so in, in California... In Oregon and Washington, uh, you have to wear masks to go into into retail businesses, regardless of your vaccination status. In California and one or two other states, I think at this point, apparently the signage and the rules are people who are vaccinated uh, don't have to wear masks inside. And um, and by and large, we hear they don't check, but you know they could. Right. Uh, and um, I guess I I I'm not. I don't see the level of difference that you do between these two things, even as I continue to 
you know, I continue to behave the way I have from the beginning. I put on the mask at the last possible moment before going in and rip it off as soon as I leave and get some dirty looks from people because, you know, you're still close to the store. How could you be unmasked? But, you know, whereas the mo most of the country at this point isn't having to wear masks at all. And, they're, you know, so masks, these masks, the way that they are being employed and the kinds of masks that people are wearing are very much like these vaccines in that they apparently aren't doing the job that we're being told they do. They are signifiers of compliance, uh, but they are uh, inaccurate signifiers of uh, health protection. Yes, they are signifiers of compliance. And in fact, they are signifiers of compliance with nonsensical health advice. Right. And um, I would point people, I haven't been fully, fully through it yet, but people should look at uh, Chris Martinson's recent interview on... Um, mass formation and the idea mm. that actually the nonsensicalness of the rituals is a feature, not a bug. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, the point I would make is we are actually somewhere else. The, the conundrum of what to do about the mask or um, more to the point, the vaccine mandates, is in some ways not well addressed by us at all. Mm -hmm. It really needs to be addressed by people who have been compliant, mm -hmm. right? In effect, what we need is for people to recognize that the mandates themselves are um, a breach of our social contract with each other, as we discussed uh, in the, the first part of the podcast. Mm -hmm. And the point is, um, if I was to go to a store, mm -hmm. right? Let's say, you know, the store said that whites only, mm -hmm. right? I'm not going in that store. Right? It doesn't matter that I may technically qualify. I'm not going in that store because I don't respect it. Now, if the government issued a mandate that said, actually, we need to segregate for whatever reason, so, you know, blank and blank, you know, on Thursdays, these stores will be whites only. So the only thing that was happening is that the store was complying. Mm -hmm. I'm still not going into the damn store. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think the point is the rebellion has to occur against the mandates, and it should unify those of us who are unvaccinated with those of us who are vaccinated because clearly the circumstances does not justify this and we are being segregated from each other for reasons that have not been shared with us. And so the point is this is all immoral. You're wrecking our civilization and you don't have a right to do it. So none of us are going to participate, right? That's the answer to this. And if, you know, the 30% yeah. of people who actually believe this garbage and, you know, haven't noticed all of the paradoxes, if those 30% are still going to participate, fine. But, you know, they can't, they're not a civilization. Yeah, they're not. Um, I'm still, I can't remember if I talked about this on air a week or two or three or eight or something ago. But, um, you know, one of the things I loved most about moving to Portland was the prospect of live theater, which I've always, always loved. And my parents lived in London for many years. Every time I'd visit, we'd, we'd see a lot. And, um, I grew up in LA seeing a certain amount and there was a little bit in Ann Arbor and we lived there, but there's none in Olympia. Um, so I went many, many years without basically having access to much. And we had, we had been seeing live theater and when COVID hit and the tickets that I had bought, um, you know, sort of disappeared into thin air. Um, I, I said to the theaters in question, um, hold on to my, you know, they, because they were desperate and we were, I felt so, so bad for, for the artists and the other, other live, the people who were doing work that required that you be live in person with people, but especially the artists and the musicians and such, um, and said, you know, hold on to my money until, until you can perform again. And then, and then I hope to, you know, use, I, I hope to come back and be in person and, they're finally opening up, um, but it's they aren't saying you can't come if you're not vaccinated, but they are saying proof of vaccine or uh, a, a, a negative test within some number of hours. And that means that technically we could we could go. But I, I, I guess for me, I felt like I was I was one of the staunchest supporters of and I re will remain of the creators whose work depends on being in person with people because we all need that. We all need, again, to reclaim our sense of collective joy and be together in person experiencing something collectively. And it's those organizations that went the most woke the fastest 
during, you know, in the aftermath of George Floyd and that have now been, you know, most eager to go with medically woke pronouncements. In some places I've heard that, you, you know, you can't even do a negative test. Um, but frankly, the, oh yeah, all you have to do is do a negative test really for all four of us for like, and you know, in what time frame and, you know, fuck you, frankly. Yeah. Well, like, no, 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 I, I think this is exactly right. And the, the problem is I don't want to do anything that signals that I believe in the fiction. I also right. don't want to signal that I ever thought COVID wasn't serious or was itself a fiction, right? right. The point is right. it was a serious disease. We now know a lot about how to treat it. There are certain people who are blocking our access to the things which would be useful in that battle mm -hmm. and forcing us to do things that are pointless. Mm -hmm. And the and thing then is, also blocking us from joyous human experience. Right. And so, you know, let's put it this way. These people have the equivalent of an, an emblem, like Nike's swoosh, right? Mm -hmm. It is the mask. And they are causing even those of us who detest them mm -hmm. to broadcast their advertisement mm -hmm. and to signal that we are compliant with the such and such. And so, okay, maybe you don't have to be vaccinated, but then you're going to need a test. And the point is, this is all predicated on the idea that you need protection from me. Right. I think the opposite is more likely to be true. Yeah. And in that, fact, there's a question to that effect here. You can keep, let me just see if I can. Anyway, I think the yeah. point is, look, the time they're vaccinating children with a vaccine that does not aid children. They're vaccinating against them against a disease that does not harm healthy children. Mm -hmm. And they are vaccinating with a, a vaccine that even if you granted them everything, we know nothing about its long-term implications, which matters more for children because they have longer lives ahead of them, yep. right? When you then add in what we do know about and myocarditis. And they're in a rapid growth phase, and so injury may proceed faster, right. depending this on what kind of injury it is. Obviously not in the children's interest as far as we can tell. Mm -hmm. Compare the disease to the vaccine, obviously not in the children's interest, therefore it is immoral. So the point is, that's the people who's... Uh, brand we're now broadcasting with our masks and whose fiction about who's dangerous to whom we're going to signal that we accept by, you know, ponying up a test that says that we are in fact free of COVID. No, the fact is we know how to deal with this disease. It's now manageable, right? The, the tests are crap. The vaccines are crap. Your indicator of compliance is just that because the indicators themselves are demonstrably crap demonstrably crap and, and, and bad for people and enough already. And so the point is, yeah, somehow what I want, what I want to figure out is some way to broadcast. I am no longer putting up with this shit without broadcasting. Right. I don't take you, my fellow citizens health seriously because I do take that seriously, mm -hmm. but I do not take these authorities. These, these authorities need to be taken seriously in a very different way. They are, they are a menace to civilization and they uh, need to be removed yesterday so that we can get something like a proper response and get back to a functional civilization. You know, you can't turn it upside down over myths. <laughs> Watch them. Well, yeah, watch them. Uh, can you steel man both sides of the following argument? If, and I'm not sure exactly what that means. If vaccines work as claimed, why would the vaxxed have to worry about the unvaxxed? So I'm not sure what steel manning both sides of that um, means. Um, but uh, well, if vaccines work as claimed, why would the vaxxed have to worry about the unvaxxed? Yeah. I, I hate to do their goddamn work for them, <laughs> right? The argument, well, they're not going to do it for themselves, are they? Well, they're they? not going to do it for themselves, yes. and, they're, and they're not frankly capable of it, or it's not their area of expertise. Or they've created arguments that are indefensible at some level, but you're about to reveal to us just well, the, the, know, thing the, is, the tiny way in which they're defensible. Let's put it this way. You, you know, this is, a, this is a garbage, as a product, this is garbage. It may mm -hmm. be a brilliant prototype, but it's not. You know, it's not up to snuff for vaccinating hundreds of millions, let alone billions of people, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't prevent the transmission of disease. It doesn't prevent you um, from contracting the disease. Now, it may have an implication for how likely you are to contract it. And therefore, it may be like a kind of viscosity that changes for from, a moment. <laughs> yeah. For a moment in time. Well, I mean, and you know, why? are we forced to accept this very small improvement in the pandemic 
that pandemic that comes from these vaccines preventing a certain number of cases without also being able to talk about the increased vulnerability that comes as you're developing the immunity. Mm-hmm. And so the point is, when did net go out the window? Right? It's a net calculation. Sorry, it just is. And net has a meaning and it's very precise. And um it's everything but net. It, <laughs> it's everything but net. That's that's beautiful. I love that. It's everything but net. Mm-hmm. And the fact is, we have the goddamn tools, right? This isn't that hard. Um, You know, we have uh, relative uh, risk reduction Mm -hmm. rather than absolute risk reduction. We have all-cause mortality rather than, you know, cherry-picked claims about particular causation. And we have number needed to treat. Mm -hmm. These are the objective, uninflected ways that you measure how valuable the thing is and compare it to its alternative. And they're not even pretending. So, um, so, but I mean, I, I haven't heard in this, the steel man of the steel. If vaccines, if vaccines are what they claim, why would the vaxxed have to worry about the unvaxxed? Because, because I don't, I because can't Because these super leaky vaccines prevent some disease probably. And so some disease probably means that if you've been injected with a so super we weak say, vaccine, when we say they don't prevent transmission, eh, they may prevent a little bit of transmission. Yeah. Because if, if really, if all they do is reduce your likelihood, having been vaccinated, of getting the disease by some small amount for some short amount of time, um, then there's no reason for the vaccinated to, to care. Well, no. Okay, so if the vaccines work as d- advertised, then all of the unvaccinated are completely unprepared for COVID, right? Like this yeah. is this is a landscape in which there are no treatments except for those that have just been developed by pharmaceutical companies. Completely unprepared. And therefore, there's this large amount of circulating virus that would be less amount of circulating virus if um, th- that would then prevent that uh, the breakthrough cases that happen among the vaccinated. Right. I guess I guess that's so the steel man. That's the steel yeah. man. And then the yeah. problem is you have to decide how serious a disease would have to be in the absence of any treatment, how yeah. serious once you have treatments that work, how serious it would have to be to justify, you know, forced vaccination. You know, you wouldn't force vaccinate over a cold. I'm not saying this is a cold, but the point is there's some line below which you wouldn't consider doing this, even if you could prevent a certain amount of disease. Yep. Um, and then there's some line above which maybe you would consider it. And the point is we never had that discussion. So we know this isn't about that. Yep. Um, um, I will say, I just so, uh, Matthew Crawford's rounding the earth newsletter on Substack is excellent. We've talked about it before and highly recommend it. Um, in today, I think, or 12 hours ago, he posted this systemic vaccine efficacy part four consistency. I think this is where, um, I can't remember exactly where. Oh, now this this whole piece is excellent. But here he says, in a complex system, consistency is the best judge of a hypothesis. Let us consider the two competing hypotheses. Hypothesis one, the very first mRNA vaccines and other COVID-19 vaccines are all the first several dozen vaccines to ever work on any coronavirus. Versus hypothesis two, the COVID-19 vaccines, mRNA and others have no substantial efficacy, but kill and injure lots of people. And he then work, you know, talks through, and I, I can't find it at the moment, but it, it's, it's worth reading the whole post. Among other things, it's not like people haven't been trying for a very long time to make vaccines of any sort, traditional, non-traditional, new, old, whatever, against coronaviruses. And, um, and obviously the first time that works will be a moment in time. Yes. And so you can't be surprised every time it happens. Like, well, why now? Like, well, it had to be some time. Um, but the, the number of those things that have converged on this moment, well, why now? Had to be sometime. Why this one? Well, it had to be sometime. Like all of these things point to like every one of those improbable events compounds with the number, with, with each additional improbable event that you add to the situation. Yeah. And that's basically the argument that he's making here. Well, yeah. So it, uh, it fits with my saying uh, that uh, epicycles are back. Right. I mean, that's yes. really yes. the point yes. is yes. that yes. somehow we have completely lost 
our obligation to parsimony yeah. here in, yes. in service of something that, again, has not been explained to us. Yeah. Uh, here are a couple of comments that you are sure to love. I've been using jab almost from the beginning as a pejorative. <laughs> and Fauci lies in promoting the mainstream COVID narrative. He tries to sound sophisticated, but it's just fibber jabber jibber jabber. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I know you're getting sick of these questions, but how long does the body produce spike after vaccine? Thank you both. Well, there's a question of how long it produces. There's a question of how long it persists. And there's a question about something prion-like. Um, Spell that third thing out. So prions it are... Producing something prion. Prion-like, a prion-like Pro phenomenon. A pri oh, Okay. And I'm not saying eliciting, there, initiating a process yeah, that is prionic. I'm not saying there is such yes. a thing. What I'm okay. saying is it is within the range of plausibility so that if you say, well, the spike's gone by hmm, number of days, weeks, hours, right. um, that doesn't necessarily answer the question of how long the effective molecular echo of spike persists. Let me also say that even within that one of the three things that you uh, discussed, I, what I what I never hear in these discussions, except on places like Rounding the Earth and from Chris Martinson and um, and and such, is is the number that the that Pfizer whoever is produced is that is that the mean and what's the variance? What was the sample size? Like none of the sort of basic parameters of a statistical understanding of a population, such that if you know, I I don't actually know have any idea what the numbers are supposed to be here, um, but so I'm going to make something up here. Okay, well the you know the body produces the spike for two months after the vaccine because that's your body you know. In a, totally making that number up. Okay, but is that two months with a range of zero months, which is to say it never produces anything at all, to infinitely, because there are some people in whom we've continued to measure it, where there's still spike after eight months at this point, or a year and a half, or a year, I guess? Um, or is that like two months, plus or minus a week, right? Like, you know, how, how tight are these tolerances? And, and is that variable by, uh, did they... I always feel like this is the wrong word, but did they aspirate when they gave the vaccine yep. such that it actually went to the place that it was supposed to go to or immediately started spreading throughout the body? You know, and, and which of these answers are contingent on which of those other truths means that a simple answer is almost impossible to arrive at. Right. And um, add to the complexity that we've got this question in parallel with the disease itself. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot right. that we could say about natural immunity and its advantages over vaccines if we could be certain that the spike protein produced by the disease itself yeah. was easily managed and was uh, ephemeral. Right. Um, right. So right. anyway, we can't say that. So you're three. So I, I stopped you after talking about the one. How long is it being produced? Yeah. That is to say, how, how long are mRNAs being uh, translated into protein? Right. There's uh, how long does it persist? Once you get these proteins, how long do they circulate around? Okay. And then there's the prion effect, which yeah. is how long does a consequence, a molecular consequence of this particular protein floating around trigger changes in other proteins? And I'm not saying it does at all. It may not, right. but it can. It could. It That's, could. It is, it's, it is it's, a it's a mechanism we know about. Yeah. And there are intimations that Spike may have some of these effects. So mm -hmm. I'm just saying it's, it's an open possibility. Yeah. So... Um, I don't think we know the answer. I do think it's likely to be highly variable. I've seen very frightening things about Spike being detectable way after somebody's encounter with the, the vaccines. Mm -hmm. um, how good is that? How much is this a question of uh, amplification protocol that's so sensitive? Who knows? All of these things are, are you know, welcome to complex systems, right? right? There are a lot of ways these things can go wrong. Um, there's also potentially, I guess, issues of... Um, molecular mimicry, triggering tests uh, inappropriately. Mm -hmm. So anyway, th th there's a world of complexity here that could be upending any proper analysis. But I do think spike is a very interesting protein and a very dangerous one. Mm -hmm. I don't think the spike from the vaccine, every time this has been accused of being false, people who know look at it and they say, no, spike protein is cytotoxic. We don't have any reason to believe the spike protein produced by the vaccines is not cytotoxic. What we may lack is evidence, you know, affirmative evidence. But but the point is you would assume, based on the fact that natural spike protein is toxic, 
um, that so is the spike protein from the vaccines. And indeed, there's some there's some suggestion that it's <clears throat> that it produces worse effects. Right. right. Um, but there's the other issue of the interaction of the body with the cells that have been transfected. Mm -hmm. Right. So this is I don't know how to take what I think I know from biology and translate it into something that people can hear. Yeah. But when you get sick with an infection, the infection gets into a cell, it spreads between cells mm -hmm. as the immune system is ratcheting up to uh, challenge it. Right. That has a kind of locality to it. The cells it is likely to transfect or, or to infect are nearby. Mm -hmm. Not all of them. It could move long distances, but there's a general pattern of locality. And this pattern of locality, incidentally, is an argument against the vaccines because we vaccinate you in the arm and you get sick in the lungs, right? And so the well, point is, you know, and, you know, entry right. tends to be nose. Well, you get sick in the yeah. um, the respiratory yeah. tract, and mm -hmm. the point is that actually the immune system has this as a dimension. You tend to get immunity where you tend to get sick because that's where you got challenged, and your right. immune system learns the pattern, but where it develops there, which reproduces the pattern of immunity where it is most needed. Okay, so when we get one of these vaccines and it circulates around, how many cells it infects, it, it's not doesn't even infect because it's not a it's not a uh, a virus that has been attenuated. What it is is a molecular package that sticks to human cells and causes the thing inside to get injected in, right? Then mm -hmm. it starts getting transcribed. And so the thing is any cell it sticks to can start making this protein, which means this protein can start showing up anywhere that the vaccine got to. Exactly. And so that is a very different thing than you have an infection in a patch of cells in your lung or your, your sinuses or something, and the immune system challenged it and did away with it. So the yep. question is, yep. we think we know in general what happens when you get a viral infection of cells, right? Ultimately, the cells that are producing virus are targeted by the immune system and destroyed. Mm -hmm. They no longer produce virus at that point. When a cell that isn't infected by a virus starts producing this protein on behalf of big pharma, mm -hmm. right? Um, then those cells, my guess would be, they get destroyed as if they were affected. So mm -hmm. now you've got cells randomly all over the body being destroyed and to the extent that they are properly destroyed then maybe it's no different than the the virus itself that or, would be the hope right mm -hmm. or the fact that you have this transient signal mm. right you get a transcript an mrna transcript into a cell which then results in that cell making this protein maybe that's not enough to get that cell destroyed and then is it just latent Right. Might, so, it, might it start producing spike again later? I'm not saying that this suggests an answer to the question. What I'm suggesting is welcome to complex systems. Yeah. You've you've intervened. So the thing is an ordinary vaccine is yeah. very elegant with respect to how it interfaces with the system. It basically just primes the system with information that it ordinarily couldn't get without an encounter with a pathogen, right? In this case, you are borrowing cellular machinery to manufacture the informational particle super clever like you know it's it's, it's brilliant. brilliant potentially but yeah. you know who knows what effect it has now right. of course some vaccines attenuated virus vaccines actually go through a process of infection with something that doesn't cause disease or causes minimal disease mm -hmm. right so that's also kind mm -hmm. of an exotic thing which we know from experience actually works quite well yeah. but the point is the body has a whole mechanism for dealing with infections Right, so it wouldn't be so strange if that turned out as crazy as that idea sounds of attenuated virus to warn the immune system. It wouldn't be so surprising if the if the body dealt with that elegantly because it's been dealing with viruses for hundreds of millions, billions of years, yeah, um, and didn't deal well with hey, you've got a fatty envelope and a an mRNA message that we're going to hijack your ribosomes with. I mean that. That's a whole different ballgame. Yeah, we're just we're gonna have it stick to a bunch of your extant cells. Hope you weren't using them. Right, right. Yeah, I'm not sure how to read this one. Uh, you may have to read it after I read it out loud because I'm not totally sure how uh, where the how to parse it. The top one, religious view 
Healthy individuals uh, can defeat any virus. Other views. Fragile, sensitive individuals are easily manipulated and infected if continuous tamper and trigger of our immune system would it lose its long-term effectiveness. I, and you can see I was I was trying to add in sort of the right part. I, I just, I can't quite parse yeah. what, what's going so on here. So do you read it as being about physiology rather than it's not a metaphor for uh, cognitive viruses? I think the religious versus other view is a metaphor for basically medically woke versus like, you know, the, the religion of those who are, who have accepted the mainstream narrative, but that it's actually a question about, um, about human biology, about anatomy and physiology, I think. Yeah. But I, but honestly, I just, I can't quite, I can't quite tell what's going on here. Yeah. Well, okay. Oh, here's what I can say. I don't think it makes sense. A view that a healthy person is effectively immune to pathogens can't be right. Um, healthy people have a great deal of immunity to pathogens that people who are compromised in one way or another do not have. So it's not that there isn't a massive difference between people who are healthy. We know that vitamin D in particular, you know, deficiency makes you vulnerable to all kinds of respiratory infections. In mm -hmm. fact, uh, a number of people who've said, I, I guess it is not Ryan Cole who said it first, but um, that there isn't flu, uh, cold and flu season, there's vitamin D deficiency season, mm -hmm. right? That it is that, which is that, you know, is that exactly right? I don't know, but it's certainly... How extraordinary if true. Yeah, it's a really remarkable and important pattern because mm -hmm. we know that the, the deficiency is highly seasonal yeah. and that the, the, these diseases are highly seasonal. Yeah, too. and the research that at least that I've looked at and that you've looked at a slightly different body of it looks very compelling. Right. Now, the... I don't think there's any reason to imagine that people who have no deficiencies are um, perfectly immune to everything. It of course can't not. be. No. Right. Um, are they are they immune given a certain level of encounter with almost any pathogen? Are they much less likely to actually contract a disease? Probably. Yeah. Right. Some people seem to never get sick. Now, I've always wondered about these people. Is it uh, a combination of well-informed immune systems by some method. We had a pediatrician who told us that he didn't get sick even when kids were coming into his office sick all the time because he believed he was breathing in enough uh, of these low levels, low of levels that his system got warned early and he never came down with anything. Yep. Now, so I don't know. Old, if, old idea that uh, seems to have lasting power. Right. Yep. And so, you know, that's a possibility and, it, you know, it might explain features of the sinuses and all. Mm -hmm. Um it could also be that people who never seem to get sick have behavioral patterns that cause them not to encounter pathogens with the same regularity, mm -hmm. right? And you, and it could be a combination of things, right? And um, I don't know. But no, I don't think there's anything to the idea that there are people who are basically just immune to pathogens. They uh, essentially can't be right. It is known that some coping techniques that serve individuals in childhood become maladaptive in adulthood. Is there an evolutionary or population level parallel? Um, yeah. Hmm. Now this, what I would say is the closer you live to an environment that doesn't change such that your ancestors were in a really good position, really well adapted to it, um, the less of these kind of uh, violent midlife course corrections or course corrections on uh, maturity will mm -hmm. be necessary. It's the discordance between environments that causes these uh, these discontinuous shifts. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, yes, of course there will be civilization level, you know, you might call them in fact revolutions or something like that, something where, you know, the, uh, the, the paradoxes or um, unfairness of a system builds up to a level that those who are dependent on it overthrow it in the hopes of producing something better, right? I mean, and, and that won't be the the only one. I mm -hmm. would say to the extent that we are in such a phase, we're caught between, I think, an overwhelming realization that things are desperately off, but polluted by 
um, those who would shape the narrative to blame others so that they can continue to commit the crimes that they are committing. And, mm -hmm. you know, so yeah. we have no agreement over what's gone wrong. And we have maybe useless agreement that something has gone wrong and it's causing a kind of incoherent pre-revolutionary um, boiling over. <clears throat> well, that actually feeds right into the next question here. Corruption and misinformation feel predator satiation levels of ubiquitous. Others likely also feel lost with regard to where to start. How do we compete with the mainstream media's perverse form of pre-mastication? It's particularly taken with this phrase, pre, this word pre-mastication, which is how I always used to refer to textbooks uh, when, when we were teaching, when we were college professors. And... Um, I think we've said this here before, but uh, the only the only program that I taught, the only material that I taught where I felt that any kind of actual textbook was warranted was uh, when I did comparative anatomy as part of my vertebrate evolution program. And um, I had students buy the lab manual because um, it had, you know, the right, it had diagrams with actual, you know, what it looks like inside sharks and cats to help guide the dissections that we were doing. Um, but in general, textbooks... Um, are pre are predigested is what I would say, but premasticate is a, is another fine way to describe it, and they therefore leave a person with a sense that that's you know that that's what is on the page is true inherently that that will not change, and that that is how science looks that that is what the scientific process looks like. Um, usually in biology textbooks, you get some very preliminary pro forma description of the scientific method, um, which is the you know, the thing that we then imagine is how science always looks. And of course, as soon as you actually engage in science, you realize just how nonlinear the process tends to be. But you don't learn that from a textbook. And if what you are learning of, say, biology is from a textbook, um, that is what you will come to believe. And frankly, the people who have learned only from textbooks who then go on to become either teachers of science or actual scientists or medical doctors or medical professionals of any sort, and I would say most health professionals have learned almost entirely from textbooks and presumably their patients, I would hope, uh, they are much more likely to assume that the received wisdom is what is true and is therefore um, how, to guide, how to guide treatment. And so... You know, the mainstream media's perverse form looks, frankly, identical to me to what textbooks have always looked like to me, and why why I eschewed, why I you know refused to let textbooks into my classrooms for the most part, um, except for under very narrowly prescribed circumstances, which is not exactly an answer. But yeah, I mean, I of course share your antipathy for textbooks. I think it's particularly bad in biology because we're so new to the study of biology and the textbook has the same encyclopedic voice that a physics textbook or chemistry textbook has, and it shouldn't. It, right. The biology textbook should be riddled with, you know what we have no idea about yet? <laughs> um, and it just doesn't. But yeah. uh, the question here, corruption and misinformation feel... Uh, predator, predator satiation, satiation levels of ubiquitous. Yeah. Now, I think this is partly not organic, right? right? Presumably, your textbook sucks, but not because the people who wrote it wanted to write a sucky textbook. Right. On the other hand, when you have rampant corruption, mm -hmm. what you want is people not to have a coherent response to it, right? right? You want you want you know your 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 opportunity to continue to remain open, mm -hmm. and so. And with misinformation, this is even an easier game to play, right? Because to the extent that you've got lots of people colluding in lots of ways, and I'm not alleging anything remarkable there, right? Yep. Boardrooms get together and they collude because it's their fiduciary responsibility yeah. to do so in some sense. Um, but the way you can destroy opposition to it is with, you know, have truths and... Uh, various stories that sound good and then blow up on investigation. You just put enough of this stuff in and people get used to, oh my God, I retweeted that thing and then ah, it put me in this terrible position because it turned out that blah, blah, blah that I didn't know, mm -hmm. you know, or I didn't read it to the very last sentence or whatever it is that causes that to happen. Mm -hmm. And it's very effective. So anyway, yeah, yeah, I don't think that's an accident is what I'm saying. Yep. Australia's NT, that's going to be Northern Territory. Yeah. Or is it Northern Territories? Northern Territory, I think. 
Um, Australia's NT now can imprison suspected close COVID contacts without trial. Historically, what is the most effective way to respond? Well, geez, I, I, I think, don't know. Again, we are lacking. I don't know. What we have is phenomena, and we know what quadrant of the library they come from. We don't have anything in that quadrant of the library that prepares us for this moment. And, you know, we have lots of totalitarian literature. We don't have turnkey totalitarian literature. And that's where we are. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think, you know, hey, just so happens you and I wrote a book. And the point of that book was you face novel stuff and we have mechanisms for dealing with it. And those mechanisms involve us talking to each other about what we see and what we think it means and advancing hypotheses and holding each other's feet to the fire and all of that. And so, of course, we're doing that. Yeah. Um, but I don't, I don't think there's a, how do you respond to an X? There's a, oh, this has some analogy to these other things and it has novel features that don't look like anything we've seen before and we shouldn't expect it to converge on one of these things because for one thing the technology makes it possible for the authoritarians to be far more surgical and far more effective in surveilling and in disrupting the opposition mm -hmm. sorry you gotta keep talking because i have to write something down <laughs> all right um um Okay, I'm done now, although now I've forgotten what I was going to say in response to what you were saying. So we're just going to move on? We're going to move on. Yeah. Um, indications seem to be that Omicron is producing less severe symptoms. Are we approaching the time for COVID parties? How will we know? Uh, let me say this very clearly. As we said last week, it is possible that Omicron could be good news if it has mild symptoms, high uh, transmissibility, and doesn't have any long-term consequences that we don't know about. I would say it's too early to say that the first thing is true, though there are indications of mild symptoms. It is going to, unfortunately, be too early to know anything about the long-term consequences. In other words, if these, if any of this... Uh, this pandemic results in harms five, 10 years out, we can't see them from here. Right. And so that's the thing that ought to have us hesitant. If it was true, and only if it was true, that this disease at the point you have gotten past it stops doing damage to you, and we have a variant that is highly transmissible and not very destructive, then this would, in fact, be, however it came into the world, would be effectively the ultimate vaccine, right? It would spread itself. It would cause natural immunity to rise very quickly. And it would rid us of these incredibly terrible public health authorities and their insane plan for I don't, I don't even want to say fixing the world because I don't think that's what they're doing. No. They're, they're screwing it up too badly for this to be simple ineptitude. So yep. if it doesn't have a destructive capacity beyond what we know, then in fact it could, as we said last week, save us from these people. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, the fly in the ointment is I don't think we know. Yeah. So it would require a gamble. Yeah. I agree. Uh, this next question I'm going to uh, ask, but save for next week and maybe even move it into the main stream for next week. I teach college English in prison. A student asked for a list of 12 books he ought to read over winter break that I thought were important. What would your respective answers be? So a list of 12 books that a student of English in prison might want to read that are important um, is, a, is an intriguing question and a big question at 12 books is a lot of books. So mm -hmm. I'm going to give it a little, uh, a thought, a, a bit of thought. Good. Uh, and we'll come back to it either in the main or the Q and a next week. What are your thoughts on water birthing after watching the business of being born, which I have not seen. I find the prospect of hospital births horrifying to be used only as a last resort. Love you both. Um, yeah. Hospital births have medicalized uh, birth. That said, birth is um, 
historically very, very hard, very dangerous actually for both mother and child. Um, but the medicalization has gone way too far and uh, has is too often now about uh, convenience uh, around scheduling and also a response to the fact that um, many mothers are no longer in the kinds of shape um, that that women ready to give birth would have been in the past, such that, you know, sedentary lifestyles and again, obesity make birth uh, just much more challenging uh, even than it would have been in the past. That said, um, you know, even, even, even with that, even with the United States is particularly bad uh, health record for both men and women, um, child mortality, you know, Maternal fatality and neonatal fatality rates are far lower than they've been historically. So, uh, even with medicalization of births, uh, things are, um, you know, we're still doing some things right in that regard. But I absolutely agree. And I haven't thought tremendously about it. We do have some friends who, who looked into it a lot and um, did water births. And it seems um, as, long as, you, as long as you have the right help, uh, like potentially a really great thing. Yeah, I would say we're we're stuck in a bind. My understanding, um, you tell me if you understand it differently, but my understanding that is that actually hunter gatherer women do not have a high rate of death in childbirth, and that in fact modernity has created a lot of the problem, probably through uh, better nutrition and therefore larger babies and allometry problems that don't get corrected by selection. I am not sure. I mean, I think overall what you said is true. I'm not sure that the first thing you said is true, but I'm not familiar. I'm not up to date on the on what we think are the mortality data. I, I remember that from college. It's possible mm -hmm. that something has emerged since then. Um, but nonetheless, that, that was the conclusion is that it is in fact modernity that makes this so dangerous. And mm -hmm. so in effect, the medicalizing of birth is um, in part the ne necessitated by um, novel phenomena, and mm -hmm. then we over-medicalize it for lots of right. foolish business reasons. And anyway, the point is but, mm. um, water birth is probably not natural. On the other hand, could it compensate for the novel distortion that modernity has inflicted on women? And so anyway, I'd be really interested to know if that's in effect what's going on, if it is a novel solution to a novel hazard. Yeah. So I'm trying to remember what I was going to say. Um, oh, if, if, it's, if it's true what you said about hunter-gatherer mothers um, having relatively low rates of, of fatality during birth, during the birthing process... Another reason for that might be, and actually this is just off the top of my head and it may be you know, already well known not to be true or it may already be well known to be true or it might not be true at all or it might be new. All of those are possibilities. Um, <clears throat> but it might be um, that uh, women in the weird world tending to have not just fewer babies but to start having babies later uh, means that um, you know, we are simply less elastic and therefore things are more likely to go wrong, mm, yeah. um, which would, you know, would be a result of you know, this uh, kind of hyper novelty, which is to women's great advantage, right? You know, having having fewer children later is absolutely correlated with higher levels of education, with higher levels of uh, life achievement and, um, you know, and quality of life and, you know, and, and a greater ability to actually care deeply and fully for the children that you do have. All of this is true. So this is not about like, therefore, we need to be having more babies earlier. No, but one of the effects might be um, that at the point that you do get around to having kids, um, your body is actually somewhat less capable of doing so because it hasn't been doing so since you basically first became reproductively capable. Yep. Keep on rocking in the weird world is the upshot to that story. But I think your analysis is quite right. That it, The senescent effect, just the simple fact that we are all less capable of healing and less capable of dealing with insult the older we are past reproductive maturity. Yeah. And, a, and a body that just hasn't had iterative experiences doing it and you know, now being asked to, you know, in my case, a few days shy of my 35th birthday for the first time. It's like, well, that's, that's gotta be harder on a body, you know, not just than on a, like a 17 year old body, but then on a body that's, you know, older, but has done it a few times and has been, ex you know, has, has, you know, expanded and retracted in the ways that it needs to. So, yep. yeah. 
Why do you think some states have less buy-in to the narrative than others? Oh, I think this is just an amplifier effect. Um, what do you mean by that? Which is to say that, um, well, if we can go back to what we were talking about earlier, people are built to census what those around them see and imagine. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that um, anything causes you to get a biased sample, it will cause you to default faster in that direction. So the point is, what is your um, basic uh, starting point, your, your priors for the likelihood that, um, you know, removing freedoms from you to fix your health is a good idea, mm -hmm. right? And now you just look at red states and blue states and how do people answer this question? And so the point is, if you're a blue person, you're much more likely to be in a blue state. And what does that mean? It means you'll be surrounded by other blue people and that's gonna amplify your sense that this is wisdom, right? And the online platforms okay. are- so positive feedback. Positive feedback is exactly, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so that positive feedback thing is then going to be hyper novelly augmented by the, um, you know, we used to call the TV the idiot box. I'm not sure what the analog for a computer in which some algorithmic monster behind the scenes is deciding what you ought to see based on some priorities it has. But I AI? What's the I? Uh, idiot artificial yeah. intelligence. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, it's artificial idiocy is, is <laughs> more or less what it is. But, but the point is, if that thing is also, you know, building a model and it discovers that, you know, you have a red... A red state of mind and it starts feeding you things that a red state of mind will feel at home with or yeah. right the point is all of these things are amplifiers and nobody ever figured out what to do about novel amplifiers because you're not supposed to be facing them right according to up to date and i don't know uh, i don't know that source according to up to date ssris need to be tapered even after only one to three weeks of use especially fluvoxamine because of its very short half-life. I feel like that should say it's very long half-life. Wouldn't the longer half-life? Um, I'm not sure. Actually, I would not. expect. Well, if why, it had why would the length of half-life be related to a, a higher or lower need for tapering? I got all? it, but I don't think... It's not a complete analysis, but imagine okay. that something had an extremely long half-life, mm -hmm. right? Then it effectively tapers itself, yeah. right? You stop taking it, and the point is oh, it, okay. it tapers if it has a very short half-life. Okay, so you have to behaviorally taper if, right. if the chemistry, if the, if, the, if the biochemistry of the thing in your body doesn't taper for you. Right. Now, I did okay. read, I saw, I wish I could remember who it was, but somebody was reporting their own recovery from COVID. Mm -hmm. Um, and they used fluvoxamine. Mm -hmm. It was the thing that they credited their very quick recovery to. And they make the point, which I think Steve Kirsch has also made this point frequently, that one of the reasons that those of us who fear SSRIs should maybe not fear the use of fluvoxamine for COVID is that the dose is actually way lower than it would be for the treatment of a mood disorder. Yeah. You know, I haven't looked into it a lot, but I got to say, I, I have the same, I have the same immediate, like, honestly, I'm visceral dead. reaction at this point um, to fluvoxamine as I do to the mRNA vaccines. It's like, mm, well, not. I don't, I don't have that reaction because the, they are, as far as we know, ephemeral. And even to the extent that they have greater effects than Which we are. understand, uh, fluvoxamine well, but I mean, precisely not maybe given, given the, you know, the long-term effects that some people who've been on them who cannot get back to normal uh, experience. Well, but we're talking about a, an extremely short treatment with apparently a low dose. And so I, I think the thing is, to me, that's not in the same ballpark as a novel transfection with an agent that then per permanently reprograms your immune system at a minimum. The permanent reprogramming of the immune system is certainly different. The uh, who knows for how long it will last effective reprogramming of your uh, synaptic connections 
seems uh, rather dramatic as well to me. Believe me, I have the same initial reaction, which is why would you use this when we have other things that don't have these kinds of side effects that appear to and be ju- and, and just risks. I mean, I, I feel like it, it feels similar to me in part because it would appear, we obviously don't have long-term data on the mRNA vaccines, but it would appear that some number of people who get vaccinated are just fine, Yep. right? And um, we, we do have longer-term data for the SSRIs, and it would appear that, you know, not nearly as many people who are on them, at least, you know, the longer you're on them, the higher the dose, all of this, yep. the worse it is. Um, but that, a, you know, a relatively small fraction of people who are on those things are just fine after a while. And it's, you know, it is, it does seem to be reversible for some people. Um, but for a lot of people, no matter how hard they try, they don't seem to be able to reverse it. Right. But I mean, we're, we're going to go around in circles. My sense is the evidence that is spooky does not come from very short term, low dose use. And the expectation would be that the effect would be quite a bit diminished. So my, look, uh, this is the first thing that I said when I heard fluvoxamine worked, which is yeah. I, I'm willing to believe that it does, but that I can't imagine why we would go to that step when we have things that don't have serious side effects. So it's not that I don't get it, yeah. but... No, and again, it's, you know, I, I guess I prefer, I guess I, I like the languaging of adverse events. Uh, for the vaccines rather than side effects. And I, th- I feel like I'm talking with regard to fluvoxamine and the other SSRIs, adverse events um, that, you know, yes, seem to be, you know, side effects-ish, but then, you know, persist for so long, have, you know, have so many things that are associated with them, um, even, you know, beyond the taking of the thing, that it's it's more of, okay, you just, you had an adverse reaction to the thing. Um, and, you know, maybe this is just semantic, but to me it feels like a more, holistic understanding of of the risk to talk about adverse events rather than side effects for the for these two classes of pharmaceuticals as corrupt as we know these pharma companies that are making these vaccines to be would they ever view the human immune system as their greatest enemy to their great empire um my guess is they would not ever consciously understand their enemy to be the immune system, but that they have a you know dozens of rationalizations yeah. that cause them to see certain kinds of of uh, therapies as promising and others as really not as promising as they might seem on first pass and all of that, and then yeah. it just so happens to result in a program that you know treats disease and fails to cure it, and you know thinks that the newfangled drug whose side effects we know nothing about is inherently better than the old drug that doesn't seem to have very many. And, you know, that those biases would fall out of some complex network of rationalizations. Yeah. Um, We are asked to consider this. Zach, you can show my screen. Uh, It's an abstract published in the journal Circulation, uh, but it's just... It's just the abstract, and it has associated with it an expression of concern, um, which all it says is expression of concern. So yep. the abstract- is there is there a question or just consider it? Yeah. What do you think of this? Um, mRNA COVID vaccines dramatically increase endothelial in- inflammatory markers and ACS risk, as measured by the POLS cardiac test. So a I, warning. I read it. I also read. So there is no paper the associated with it, right? I can't find one. Right. No, so I'm when you say f- you read it, you read the abstract, I'm right? I'm not familiar with circulation, so I don't know if it's normal for them to publish an abstract without a paper. I assume it must be in some regard. I don't know if that means that somebody gave a paper at a conference and this is the abstract or what. But I can say um, I find the warning bizarre. Yeah. I don't think there's anything strange about this abstract and the warning complains about certain things that aren't in the abstract that the abstract doesn't claim are in the abstract oh so i don't see a warning beyond what i clicked here um so you can click through a couple of clicks into that warning the warning is just that long yeah but they published a separate thing that looks oh see okay so zach you can show this um you want to read it this article expresses concern regarding the abstract etc etc uh, which originally was published November 8th. Soon after publication of the above abstract and circulation, it was brought to the American Heart Association Committee on Scientific Session Program's attention that there are potential errors in the abstract. 
Specifically, there are several typographical errors. Yep. There is no data in the abstract regarding myocardial T cell infiltration. There are no statistical analyses for significance provided. And the author is not clear that only anecdotal data was used. We are publishing this expression of concern until a suitable correction is published to indicate the abstract in its current version may not be reliable. Um, so this strikes me as highly unusual. That warning appears yeah, to imply that it was a, the abstract Oops. of a so-called paper. So for those who are not academics. Oh, I read it the opposite way. I read it as this is just an abstract. Well, but it says that it was brought to the committee on, I forget what their language was. Yeah, but they say the abstract was brought. They don't say the paper was brought. Um, soon, pu soon complaint. after publication of the above abstract in circulation, yes. it was brought to the American Heart Association Committee. Committee of? On scientific session programs, Sci attention. Scientific session program. So I think what they're saying is they published the abstract of a session, that is to say a conference session. Mm -hmm. And so this was a paper delivered as a speech mm -hmm. and they have published the abstract. We don't have access to the speech. I don't know that that's what one should infer, but it's what I would infer. In, in any case, the complaint is highly unusual. First of all, what is suggested in here, and I believe, you know, I can't see the work, but what is suggested appears straightforward, which is that they measured these biomarkers for inflammation before and after vaccination, and they found large increases in the, um, these markers. Okay, that doesn't say what the consequence of it is. So, I mean, also, I, I, I had read this, but it's, it's, I mean, it came out almost a month ago. Um, so among other things in this, it says a total of 566 patients aged 28 to 97, male to female ratio one to one, seen in a preventive cardiology practice, had a new POLS test drawn from two to 10 weeks following the second COVID shot and was compared to the previous. But the expression of concern is that the data are anecdotal. Right. I don't, I don't see what in here suggests that these data are anecdotal. I don't either. I don't think typographical errors is such an absurd... But you uh, obviously don't pull an abstract for typographical errors. You go in and right. fix the so commas or whatever it is. I think, I think what is, we but, can infer is um, that this but, is... But, 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 but an actual complaint, an yep. actual scientific complaint, it's anecdotal data. They didn't say that. Oh, well, you, A, you should just fix that in the abstract if that's true. But I don't, I don't see even if what was done... It, you know the the expression of concern doesn't say they didn't do what they said they did. It says, among other things, it was anecdotal. And I'm looking at this, going, I don't. If, if they did what they said they did, I don't see how that can be anecdotal. Well, it may be a highly technical use of the word anecdotal mm -hmm. because, to the extent that um, you know, maybe they didn't intend to study this, and these blood draws were done, and these markers were assessed and then somebody said, Hey, I wonder, right. Okay. So that's not hypothesis driven, but as you well know, that's how like oh, the vast me. majority I of mean, science is published is done. Now it pretends, some of it pretends to be hypothesis driven. Most of it doesn't even fucking care. You don't right? hear like, me <laughs> defending that warning. At all. I, I think that warning is a continuation of the pattern that we saw with Rose and McCullough, where mm. some highly unusual academic demon has shown up and done some highly unusual thing because these facts are unforgivable. Yeah. Right. And so mm -hmm. that thing yeah. keeps telling us that, hey, a, a scientist doing scientific work, and this is, you know, preliminary work, but then right. nonetheless, it says something, it tells yeah. you what it says, it tells you how they came about the information, it's all very normal. Which also, incidentally, if, if, if you're right, and I also read academic sessions as an indication that this is uh, an abstract, which is the summary of a paper that was presented at a conference, this is what conferences are for. This yep. is like this is what conferences are supposed to be for. This is where people uh, with similar research interests get together and share with each other preliminary preliminary findings or findings that are about to be published or in some cases that have already been published. But mostly, this is the place where all of the experts in some particular domain get together and expose ideas to one another and hash things out. So the idea that a research abstract, especially if it's from a talk at a conference, um, is you know, not highly refined enough is an absurd critique because that's exactly what they're supposed to be about. Right. I mean, not, not that, you know, not that we prefer it when they're not refined or when they're preliminary, but like, that's what conferences are. That's what they are. Yes. And in this case, there is a proper response. If you think there's something wrong with this beyond typos, which is that you, you write yeah. your own paper and it says, here's why that doesn't mean what you think it does. Yeah. Right. And the point is instead, what they did is they went to the teacher and they tattled, mm -hmm. and their tattle involves typos 
Mm -hmm. right? And, you know, the point is, it's nonsense. Yeah. Why are we seeing nonsense in this place? Well, everything surrounding COVID is abnormal, right? Yeah. You're not allowed to do normal science. You're not allowed to do normal medicine. You're not allowed to have your own opinion. You're not allowed to decide whether or not uh, treatments that are ineffective are actually something you want or don't want. All of the right. rules have been changed around COVID, and that's the problem. Yes. Okay. I think we're at an hour. Uh, two more quick questions. Will your podcast be available in Spanish at some point? Um, I don't know about translation. We've been asked that before. I think it would be useful to have it in Spanish for sure. Uh, the book's going to be in Spanish as well as Lithuanian and other languages. Um, but uh, we don't have any immediate plans because we have too many other immediate plans <laughs> <laughs> that we are trying to make sure uh, keep happening. If there is um, a future. But we would love for that to happen in Spanish. It would certainly be the first language that um, we would we would hope for uh, translation services in. Yep. Uh, and and you are not the first person to ask. And then finally, let's go with this from Sally. What happens to natural immunity when the vaccine is introduced into the body? What happens to natural... So first of all, we have to separate between innate and natural immunity. So natural immunity refers to immunity derived from infection. And so the question is, what happens to the immunity that a recovered person has had when you introduce the vaccine? Now, early Do we have to call those persons of recovery? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know what we have to do next, but I'm not complying. Good. Um, Good. The problem is, so I pointed out, hmm, I don't know, how, when the vaccines first showed up, there were all kinds of concerns that weren't really addressed, right? Mm -hmm. One of them is... Just imagine the cartoon version of the immune system. Okay, a cartoon version of the immune system encounters COVID. It mounts a response. It defeats COVID, and it leaves the person with a memory library of responses to COVID. Okay, then you introduce one of these vaccines or so-called vaccines. That vaccine triggers the production of spike protein by one's own cells. Now you have spike protein in a system that has already been warned about pathogens wearing spike protein, right? And so one of the things that may likely happen, and one of the reasons that you may find that there is an increase in vulnerability right after you've been vaccinated, is that what you've done is you've dumped spike protein into a system that remembers spike protein, and you've occupied that fraction of the immune system that was aware of this thing. And so now if something comes in wearing spike protein, it doesn't signal an alarm, it doesn't get special attention, right? So anyway, that's one thing that may happen. Um, there's another thing, uh, it's a little hard to see. Maybe it doesn't have a negative consequence, but there's this thing called original antigenic sin, mm -hmm. which is basically a translation for once, you know how once you've encountered a something, that thing then informs your visual system, so you're more likely to see that thing again? Well, the immune system is like this in the sense that once it's been taken down a particular road, it has a hard time finding its way back and taking a different road. And so in this case, um, it is possible that there's some slightly different reaction to the vaccines. Is that harmful? I don't know. It's much more likely to be harmful in the other direction. If a naive immune mm -hmm. system encounters the vaccines and gets, for example, hyper-focused on spike protein, which is maybe not the best way to fight a, a complex pathogen, right? Then it may get hyper-focused on spike protein if the pathogen shows up. And mm -hmm. so what you've done is you've misinformed the immune system or poorly informed it. And that means that the excellent response that recovered people have won't have been uh, had by people who've been vaccinated first. So yep. anyway, the answer is we don't know. But um, <laughs> we don't know, but welcome to Complex Systems. There are lots of things in play here, and that's part of the problem. Indeed. All right. I think we are, I think we've reached the end. We've reached the end, and we are so far north that it is beginning to get dark outside. Uh, it's just, wow, it really is. I mean, yeah. we're also in the trees. Uh, that That has not changed since we began live streaming today. No. The no. trees? Oh. Yeah. A little bit, a little, but it's little but it's, taller. It's December, so not much. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, growth rings show us that for sure, right? Totally. Yeah. Okay. Um, we will be back next week. Same place, different time. Four hours earlier, I think, is when we'll be starting next week. Uh, in the meantime, consider um, 
getting some direwolves or epic tabby or you know digital book burning stuff at the store join us at our patreons uh, go check out natural selections and lots of other things i've forgotten to mention i'm sure dark horse moderator at gmail.com can answer your logistical questions and until next time be good to the ones you love eat good food and get outside consider sneering at an authoritarian politely well everyone